we're basically stopping and taking a narrow view and not looking at the holistic aspect of the human being and giving people their power back. This particular topic uh, that I want to do today is initiated primarily because of a recent study that has come out dealing with the idea of serotonin and biochemical imbalance in relationship to depression. You know, it's been for many years since the 1990s, sort of been promoted that a biochemical imbalance is the cause of my depression. And uh, the question is, is what's really driving depression if the serotonin levels aren't the only factor or not as much of a factor as they like to make it seem? The reason I've been saying that is because I've helped many, many people with depression um, over the years, over the decades. And suddenly they had enough dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine in their brain after asking a series of questions and breaking down some of the delusions and unrealistic expectations and fantasies that they were harboring. So I go, well, something's not, that must not be causal. And I've not been a firm believer in the biochemical model for all these years um, because I've seen too many cases, hundreds of cases that resolved their depression without having to take any chemical. And, um, and I know that the biochemical changes in the brain can occur by the changes in ratios of perceptions and expectations. If a tiger jumped into a room, all of a sudden you're next to it, and you quickly did your biochemical analysis, you'd find imbalanced biochemistry because you're perceiving a tiger about to eat you. So these things can change in 200 milliseconds. And uh, so I'd like to go down the rabbit hole a bit on that and talk about depression for a second and why the biochemical model and uh, you know, just because we, we, we've confused causal with correlated. To say that a biochemical is the only cause or the cause of these depressive states or these cyclic states um, is a little bit um, stretching it. Maybe correlated uh, or maybe not even correlated in some cases. In fact, some have shown. I went to a conference in Toronto a number of years ago, 2008, I believe, about a thousand psychiatrists there, and I just kind of joined them in and listened in, see if I could learn some things. And I got a manual that they gave out at the door. And um, back then, now this is 12, 14 years ago, um, they were saying that there's a de decrease in effectiveness and not even greater than some placebo effects on these, these serotonin or selective serotonin uptake inhibitor chemistries that they were giving to people or norepinephrine uptake inhibitors or dopamine uptake inhibitors and they were not really getting the effects and it was stated at this conference and i was amazed to how that was done and it was, wasn't widespread and it's taken out 12 to 14 years for now this article to come up and actually make some sort of contribution and difference so the question is is what's really going on so let me just share with you something that's going to shock you. And I know I'm going to get a, some reaction from this because you're so programmed. Most people are programmed, not all, not you necessarily each individual, but many people are anyway, programmed by the biochemical pharmaceutical model that um, you just automatically assumed that was true. I've not believed that all these years because I've seen clinical evidence that points against it. But uh, What's interesting is, is, is depression really a condition? Ooh, that's a shocker, because if you're depressed, you're thinking, well, I've got to have it. See, we have a tendency to want to create a false attribution bias towards external circumstances because of the repercussions of what people think about us if we're down and we're not up. The whole positive thinking movement says you got to be up all the time. You got to be up. If not, you're a failure or something. And that's just not so. Every human being has periods of cycles of ups and downs and mild or moderate degrees. Euthymia is just very small ones. Cyclothymia is a little more, more moderate. And, uh, you know, bipolar condition and manic and depressive states is more extreme. It's like a spectrum there. And I think most everybody has periods of highs and lows. They have mood swings, uh, self-esteem swings, revolving around their true self-worth, which is the center of those. 
and you have a homeostatic mechanism in the brain, neurochemically, electronically, to try to bring that into balance. And the question is, what can throw those off? And I am absolutely certain one thing that I've demonstrated over and over again is subjective biased interpretations of reality and um, unrealistic expectations that have been programmed into us by injected traditions and moral hypocrisies, et cetera, that lead to these things. So I'd like to discuss those. So I'm going to describe depression as a comparison of your current reality, which is balanced, even though you're conscious of one side and unconscious of the other, a comparison of your current reality to an unrealistic expectation, fantasy, or delusion about how life's supposed to be. Because I've had people who are depressed, and I found out what they were comparing their life to about how it should have happened, supposed to have happened, wished it would happen, or whatever, found out what they thought it should be, found the downsides of what they were, because they were assuming all upsides, no downsides. And when I came up with the downsides about how they were comparing their life to, about how it should have been, all of a sudden they weren't depressed. And I've seen this over and over again. I had a, a recently in the, my breakthrough experience, my signature program, which I teach a lady who said, well, my mother wasn't there when I was a child and I was abandoned. And of course the psychologist, you know, had heyday with that and said, the reason why she's all screwed up in her life is because of that type of thing. It's a false causality. It's not because they were abandoned, it's the cause. That's a, an event that occurs, but their perceptions, decisions, and actions determine what happens out of that. If you have an expectation that your mommy's supposed to be there and they're not, then you can go, oh, they, they're the cause of my problems. But the reality is, um, I asked this person, when your mother wasn't there, what specific trait, action, inactions did you perceive that you missed out on? And they started listing them. And I said, and at the moment when your mom disappeared and was no longer there or wasn't there, who took it on? And they go, well, nobody. I said, look again. And then they realized that they became more resourceful and took on some of that or a mother's friend did or an aunt or a big sister or a teacher or somebody else in their life took it on and they didn't see it. And all of a sudden they go, hmm, or they turned it into sort of a doll, an inanimate object became a doll that would talk to them and say the things that the mother was, that they wanted their mother to say. But we found out that the mind um, was become aware when I asked the right questions, because the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions asked, what was the new form and what was the benefit of the new form and what would have been the drawback if they had been there the way you fantasized? Because you're assuming if they've been there, it would have been all positive or more positive than negative. But if I ask, what's the downside if they were there, the mother was there, and what's the benefit of these new people taking on those roles? Once I level that, the anger is gone, the depression's gone. I, I call it the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I's of negativity. Anger and aggression, blame and betrayal, criticism and challenge, despair and depression, desire to escape and exit the situation, futility and frustration, grouchiness and grief, hatred and hurt, irritability, almost insanity, irrationality. Those, be, those are byproducts of our comparing our reality to fantasies and unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations that mommy is supposed to be there at all the times and not ever missing, which is unrealistic, or be positive and never negative, which is unrealistic, or to read your mind and know what you want and always be there and do what you want, unrealistic. I can find 15 common unrealistic expectations in most people that are depressed. They have an unrealistic expectation on themselves to live one-sided, positive without negative, nice without mean, peaceful without warful, kind without cruel, or an unrealistic expectation that they're supposed to be living in somebody else's values and be somebody they're not, inauthentic, which the brain doesn't allow, or an unrealistic expectation of others to live in your values or others to live one-sided, or the world in general, collective consciousness to be one-sided and not have peace and war, and not be supportive and challenging or praising and criticizing. Anytime you have unrealistic expectations on a monopole expectation of one-sidedness or something the world's supposed to live in your values or you're supposed to live in other people's values, um, instead of communicating what you value in terms of other people's value and them doing the same, you're going to have depression. And what they found is depression may not even be an illness. I, I'm not even a believer that it's an illness. I believe that's a label that got a pharmaceutical industry to be able to sell drugs to people sometimes and psychologists to be able to treat some sort of therapy at times. I believe that it's actually the brain doing its job to try to 
associate pain with fantasies and unrealistic expectations to associate pain with pleasure. You know, if you want to change a conditional reflex and a behavior on something, you can take a, something that you think is really pleasurable and addicted and associate pains with it and withdraw that from being an addiction or something you think is terrible and find the benefits of it. And a cognitive reappraisal approach like that in cognition can change the seeking or avoidance responses, the impulses and instincts that run by our amygdala and our survival part of our brain. If we do that, we're going to be, you know, changing those perceptions. And I think depression is a feedback mechanism, a, a negative feedback system to try to let people know that they have unrealistic expectations. They're being inauthentic and they're basically uh, needing that to associate pain with the fantasies that they're holding on to, to get them back into equilibrium. The reason being is because I go in and find out what their fantasies are. And I have not seen one depressed case, not one that didn't have unrealistic expectations and fantasies stored inside you may not know how to ask them. I'm pretty good at asking the questions to bring it out. But once you see it there, they usually bring tears and have a catharsis in their rest. Oh my God, no wonder I'm depressed. I've got something that's not real that I'm pursuing. And if I go and crack the fantasy on that and find the benefits of actually what's occurring, because anytime you compare your current reality to a fantasy of how it should have been, would have been, could have been, you're not going to appreciate your life because you're not, the way it is is the way it is. And if you compare it to what it isn't, then you're basically not present with what is and not appreciating what is. So I go in there and crack the fantasy on there. And all of a sudden the depression comes up because I'm, I'm breaking the addiction to a fantasy about how life's supposed to be. And this is very important in people's lives to realize that they're, they're hoodwinkled. You know, you're told in, in churches to be a morally one-sided, which is hypocritical, uh, that, that you're not going to live by. No human being is nice without mean or kind without cruel or positive without negative all the time. These are absolute moralities that are unobtainable, and they're basically the pursuit. In the Buddhist tradition, it said the desire for that which is unobtainable, one-sidedness, and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable, the other-sidedness, is a source of human suffering. We live in a one-sided world? No, that's not real. If I was to go to look in the mirror, I couldn't say I'm always positive and never negative or always kind and never cruel. I would look in there and I go, sometimes I'm nice when you support my values. Sometimes I'm mean when you challenge my values. I can be kind, cruel, giving, taking, generous, stingy, considerate, inconsiderate, uh, you know, thoughtless, thoughtful. I could be positive, negative, peaceful, wrathful. I could be all pairs of opposites. I went through the Oxford Dictionary many 37 years ago and and I found that I had all 4,628 traits. Gordon Alport also did that and found over 4,000 traits that human beings have. And nothing's missing in me. I use all those traits at different times to accomplish what I want. But if I have a fantasy that I'm supposed to be one-sided or people are supposed to be one-sided or always people are supposed to be kind and peaceful and nice and everything else, life's not going to match that. I'm going to be depressed because it's not matching my fantasy. And if I hold on and I'm addicted and attracted and impulsively demanding that fantasy onto the world, the law of heuristic escalation is going to come in and neutralize that with the opposite side. And I think the mind is doing that. And that's why I don't want to label uh, depression a disease. That's what's so commonly done. But they label almost everything disease in order to put a diagnosis on it so doctors can communicate it and pharmaceutical companies can sell something for it or therapists can sell something for it. I'm not convinced that's the solution. I'm not convinced that's real. And I know some of you have been through major depressions and everything else. You're saying, I don't believe that. That guy's crazy or whatever. Well, I haven't had the opportunity to ask you the right questions and bring it out of your and make you aware of those delusions you might be holding on to. So you'll probably be upset with me when I say that. And that's perfectly understood. And that may be the very thing that's part of your depression, because if it doesn't match your reality, when you're down, when you're not living your life uh, ba based on your highest values, you're not living by priority. You're not doing something meaningful. You're not doing something creative that inspires you. You're not having a job that's meaningful. You're not in relationships that's meaningful. You're not having meaningful life. Your blood glucose and oxygen goes into your amygdala. Your amygdala wants to avoid predator and seek prey. It wants to avoid negative and seek positive. It's the animal survival mode. It's mass conscious herd instincts and impulses. And that's where most people are. They're wanting to avoid any challenge and seek everything easy. And immediate gratification costs life. And long-term vision that embraces both pains and pleasures and support and challenge and all pairs of opposites has already been proven to help maximize growth. You need prey and predator. You need support and challenge. You need both sides, praise and reprimand to keep you authentic. 
If you get puffed up with praise and you start getting yourself up to pride, you then project your values onto other people and expect with imperatives others to live in your values, which is futile and fatal in some cases. And if you minimize yourself, you'll be sacrificing yourself for others. We're not here to sacrifice others for us or others for us for others. We're here to learn how to be in sustainable, fair exchange with equitability and equity and equanimity. And that comes from living by highest priority and living in your highest, um, you know, most inspiring mission for life. People that have a mission, people that are doing something meaningful, people that are inspired by their job, people that are inspired by their relationship, people, they don't have time for that because they're in the forebrain, they're in the executive center, they're manageable, they're more objective, they're more reasonable, they're more uh, aware of life in its fullness. They have mindfulness instead of halffulness. When you infatuate with something, you're conscious of the upside, unconscious of the downside. You're blind, and you now have a fantasy about it. And now when you're resentful to something, you're conscious of the downside and unconscious of the upside. And now you have a fantasy to escape it. First, you have a fantasy to seek it. Then you have a fantasy to escape it. And you have a nightmare of being or having lost it and having a nightmare of, of being around it. And these polarities, these absolute polarities of perception are what's involved in these depressive states and manic states. And I saw an article recently about the idea you can separate the two. I haven't found them separate. I know how to ask the right question and show where the mania is in their depression, where their fantasy and unrealistic expectation in their depression. It's usually unconscious. Sometimes it goes back and forth, but once you identify it, you can see the source of it. And then the depression does, doesn't seem like a mystery. It seems like it's actually got a motive and it's got a me mechanism to try to break our addiction to things that are unrealistic. So I'm not a believer that this is a biochemical imbalance cause. That may be associated with it. We've not found not just serotonin. That's the most common. One. All those, you know, those those drugs uh, you know, that they've used for depression. Almost all of them are serotonin, selective serotonin inhibitor, uh, uptake inhibitors, and they're also norepinephrine and dopamine ones. But there's also other chemistries. In fact, you won't be able to find almost any chemistry in the brain. It's it's not associated with these feelings and moods. You're going to find out that glutamine and, and, and glut, glut, glutamate, glutamate and also GABA, gamma, GABA aminobutyric acid, both these transmitters and NL aspartate, all these transmitters in the brain are all going around and fluctuating constantly. If you're infatuated with somebody, your impulse is to go after it, but your executive function in the forebrain is trying to set up a, a balance of glutamate and GABA to try to bring that back into balance so you're not impulsively running your life. It, it, it normalizes and balances out the impulses and instincts that are normally distracting you in your life. The same thing if you're resentful to something or frightened of something, it tries to calm it down. So if we go in there, we're going to find biochemical imbalances. If you do a blood test, you're going to find glutamate and you're going to find GABA imbalances, and you're going to find serotonin imbalances, and you're going to find dopamine imbalances. But again, that's not causal. That's just mean that anytime you're perturbing your perceptions, these things are going off. If I guarantee if somebody was to come in there with a tiger, and they were to do a, a door open and a tiger jumped in, if I was to do your blood chemistry right before it jumped in, you'd have one set in 200th of a millisecond, the second you see the tiger, your perceptions changes the neurochemistry. And all of a sudden, your your dopamine goes down, serotonin goes down, norepinephrine might go up, your cortisol will go up, your you know you would have uh, testosterone go up, your your estrogen would go down, your encephalons and endorphins would go down, your substance P would go up. All these chemistries, glutamate and and GABA would go into action to try to bring those back into balance intuitively. So you would go in there and you'd say, okay, you got a biochemical imbalance. There's the cause. That's a false attribution bias to deficiency of chemistry inside the human psyche when the homeostasis of the brain is profound. No pharmaceutical company can compete with the homeostasis of the human brain. They can assist, but that's only because we're not taking the time to find out what's going on inside the human being, what's going on in their psychology, and what's going on in their sometimes genetics or epigenetics. And epigenetics is even more profound than genetics today. What's going on is we're finding out that epigenetic induced uh, changes in physiology are because of our perceptions of our environment. If we perceive something supporting it, our parasympathetic nervous system comes on. We end up getting a, an acetylation, hit, getting in there and create different protein tra transmitters that are being secreted from cells. And so neurons secrete a different cell if you're supported in your mind. And then you get the reverse of that and you get a methylation 
and an epigenetic methylation, if you get challenged and you get a different set of transcriptions and proteins that are now secreted from the cell wall. So we, we're basically stopping and taking a narrow view and not looking at the holistic aspect of the human being and giving people their power back. I'm interested in helping people have their power back by teaching them how to manage their state. You know, if we, have, if we have a completely balanced perspective, we don't have depression or mania. We're not in, infatuated or resentful. We're not elated or depressed. We're not proud or shame. We're centered. We're authentic. We're empowered. The second you infatuate with somebody, you're, you minimize yourself relative to them, and that's a disempowerment. The second you exaggerate yourself to somebody and resent them, you're too proud to admit what you see in them inside you, a disempowered state. Anytime you're not authentic, you're disempowered. Anytime you do, you create symptoms in your physiology and psychology, which is a feedback system, a homeostatic feedback system to get you back to being who you are. The magnificence of who you are is far greater than any of those volatilities and vicissitudes. And the addiction to one-sidedness, feeling good all the time, is the very source of some of the depressions we have. So I'm not here promoting that false attribution bias that we got a deficiency of drugs on the, on the, in our life. Or, or, and I, I'm a firm believer that we have, we have power and control over our physiology. We have, we, but we're not educated. And it's just like anything else. I was reading or, or watching a video this morning when I was doing my workout. And it was on a, a parasite down in Africa. And it was a, basically a, a parasitic worm, a nematode worm that was there. And um, it was interesting. The people were getting it from a water hole that was sacred by ancestors for many generations. And so they would go in there thinking that that would cure them. And that was the very source of them. So there was a lack of education. And so they've had to go in there. In fact, Jimmy Carter had to go down there and educate them on this with a team and let them know that that's, that, that sacred hole is not what they think. <laughs> it's the source of their Ill illnesses that they've got, which is causing blindness and by, by the time they're 20 years old. And what was really interesting is the education finally woke them up and made them now aware, and it's almost eradicated the disease because of education. I'm a firm believer that if people were educated about how their physiology, psychology, expectations, unrealistic expectations, fantasies were impacting their chemistry and how their perceptions were impacting their chemistry, if they were really educated on that and they knew how to take control by living by priority and having a tool, which I developed called the Demartini Method to help people stabilize their emotions, they wouldn't have to be having a deficiency of drugs. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place because in some extreme cases, it may be a blessing. But that's not the first line of a defense in my opinion. That's not the first choice in my opinion. That's a secondary, a tertiary choice. I believe that you want to take accountability and be aware of what's going on and, and take command of your life and find the order that's in your so-called chaos. The disorder is perception. It means missing information. It means you're unconscious. You're not asking the right questions. And you're having false expectations about how life's supposed to be. Give yourself permission to take command of your life and learn how to master your own objectives. You know, I, I teach the breakthrough experience every, just about every weekend, most weekends out of the year. In the process of doing it, I have people in depressed. I mean, it comes in, they come in almost every week, depression and uh, bipolar condition and dissociative dis and abandonment issues and attention deficit. They got all these labels on it. And the second they all of a sudden learn how to stabilize their perceptions, asking new questions, hold themselves accountable on how to perceive differently, which I call the Demartini method, and learn how values play a role in our behavior and how to prioritize their life and take command of their life, and all of a sudden start being more objective and more realistic in expectations. The report is my depression's lifted. I stopped. And they, and I've never told people to stop their drug. They just stop them because they don't, they don't feel they're needing them anymore. They're back on track again. They're inspired by their life again. Our natural mechanism to be inspired. But if we're trying to live in other people's values or trying to get others to live in our values or setting up fantasies of one-sidedness and have unrealistic expectations, and we're down in our amygdala where we're avoiding pain and seeking pleasure and trying to be one-sided, we're automatically going to be living to eat instead of eating to live. We're not going to be feeding our mind quality nutrition. We're probably not going to have realistic expectations and objectives that are meaningful and inspiring. And if the people actually go after and prioritize their life and start doing the method and neutralizing it and learn how to ask the right questions, because because that liberates them from a lot of baggage, because anything you're infatuated or resent, anything you're proud or ashamed of is going to be occupying your mind and your tendency when it's not fulfilling is to that emptiness is going to want you to look for a quick fix. 
and a one-sided world, which leads to depression. That's why you find the amygdala is involved in that, dopamine and norepinephrine, and these chemistries are there. But that's not, again, the cause. That's the, that's the side effect, the side effect of not being in command of your life. I'm a firm believer that you have the ability to govern your life and you can transcend that state. I'm a firm believer that you can, if you ask the right questions, become cognitive aware of, of things objectively and have balanced orientation. You're not going to have a balanced chemistry with an imbalanced mind. You're not going to have a balanced physiology with an imbalanced mind. You're not going to have an, a balanced mind with imbalanced perceptions. And you're not going to have a balanced perception unless you had to know how to ask the questions to equilibrate the mind from your initial perception that are usually subjectively biased and, and in a sense, causing these emotional reactions. I'm a firm believer you have the power to do it. I've been dedicated the last 50 years of my life trying to help people master their life and empower their life. I'm not looking for a, a false attribution biases. It's a cause by this, and this is a solution. You know, you have a biochemical balance. Why? And you need this drug. No, that's not the solution. And they finally put a, a, a they've had actually references on this. I can show you at references that go back further. But finally, one really hit the market this last few weeks here, uh, dealing with the, the biochemical model. And most doctors are probably going to just keep quiet about that. But the reality is, you want to make sure that you find a way of taking command of your life again. That's why I tell people to come to the breaks experience so I can teach them how to do that. So I can help them ask new questions, help them see things objectively, help them set goals that are reasonable and really meaningful and inspiring to them. So they're not in their amygdala. They're not down into their bipolar states. They're, they're in that objective state where they're setting goals that are truly meaningful and they're learning how to love and have intimacy with people that they appreciate instead of false expectations on themselves and other people by putting them on pedestals or pits instead of putting them in your heart. If you want to put people in your heart, you want to be more meaningful and have a more meaningful life. You want to be more inspired. You want to learn how to self-govern your behavior. You want to learn how to transcend the labels of these false attribution biases and not be so volatile and run by the external world. Then please come to the breakthrough experience. The way you master your mind so you can master your life. I've got proven personal development tools in there. The Demartini method, which I've used now for years, I've been working on it for 50 years on how to dissolve that and something you can use the rest of your life on your own at home with your loved ones. It's a tool you can use and also how to set goals and how to set objectives that are congruent with high values where you have high probability of achieving them. So you live with meaningfulness and priority and purpose in life. And this is what happens to people that are depressed when they don't have a purposeful job, they don't have a purposeful life, they don't have a purposeful relationship. There's a science in how to reclaim that. And that's what I want to teach you in the, in the breakthrough experience. There's, there's seven major, there's actually more than seven proven tools in there. There's just a wealth of information on how to help you master your life. So if you're interested in mastering your life and transcending this illusion of depression and getting past the external world causing you these imbalances, then come to the breakthrough experience. I'm absolutely certain you can come there and actually change your, your dynamic if you do. Because if you take command and you listen to the principles and apply the principles, you're going to see the effects. You're going to watch the transformation right there on the spot. Not someday, if you theory, it's right there you get to experience it if you follow the instructions and do it exactly as I'm in, in instructing in the process. It's quite impressive. If you do, your life's going to have a shift and the trajectory of your life can change. And your chemistries, you can take command of your chemistries. Every time you change the ratios of your perceptions, you're changing your chemistries. Let me show you how to do that. Let me show you how to ask the right questions. Because what the questions you ask determines what you're conscious of. And if you're fully conscious, you balance your chemistry. If you're unconscious of things, you've got an imbalanced chemistry. And I know that you can balance it and you have the power to do that. So I want to show you how to do that. And I want you to come to the break to experience so I can help you master your life. Even if you're not depressed, maybe you know somebody is depressed. But you, what you learn there, you can help them or yourself transform your life. So I know that I do every week, I do this little 30 minute presentation, but thank you for joining me. Come to the Breakthrough Experience. I promise you, you'll get something out of it you won't get anywhere else. And you're going to learn some really amazing physiology, psychology, neurology. You're going to learn endocrinology. You're going to learn a lot of stuff there that's going to mind blow you. And I, I know I've asked people at the end of the program every week, how many of you learned something this weekend? You could have gone your whole life and not learned. Every hand goes up week after week after week. So if you've enjoyed these little presentations, also, please tell people about these 30 minute presentations I do every week, because uh, sometimes I've, I've heard from people that 
you know, it just boom, it was right on time for what they were facing and it, it rang true to them. And so just please let that be spread. Let people know about it. If you know somebody that's depressed or whatever, so that at least they know there's an option out there. Instead of just living on drugs, there's side effects of drugs. It affects people long-term and you need to read the physician's desk reference if you're going to take them. I say, instead of that, take command of your life, stop the pulse attribution biases, take command, take accountability. You have the power to change your chemistries and you have the ability to make a difference in your life. Come to the Breakthrough Experience. Let me show you how to master your mind and master your life. Until next week, this is Dr. Martini. See you next week.